Okay, welcome to day three of the Money View Symposium. Uh, super excited to to kick things off, and this session is going to be um, going over some of the things the Money View community has been up to, the online Money View community has been up to in the last year, and uh, talking a little bit about what we're going to be doing next year. And people who have been participating in that will. Um, be welcome to join in the discussion and anyone who has any thoughts or questions um about it i think we're right now we don't have too many people so we can keep it we can keep it pretty informal um but i just you know i want everybody to know that the fun doesn't stop with the money view symposium uh so we keep going all year online um uh, i'm going to talk about uh the Every year we have a group of people who's going through the MOOC and retaking the MOOC and discussing it over Zoom and over Reddit. Uh, and then we also have a Money View reading group that's been reading a lot of different books and occasionally some papers in between. Um, that's been going since the original Money View Symposium three years ago. So after the first Money View Symposium, uh, we all had ideas about what we wanted to do, and this was one of them, and uh, it's a success uh, because we keep going. Um, as I announced yesterday, the next book that the Money View Reading Group will be reading is uh, Anushka Padia's uh, Political Theory of Money, which um, just came out or is just about to come out. It might not be available until February 6th, uh, but we have plenty of time. The first discussion session is going to be on uh, Tuesday, February 20th, so I'll put that link in the chat here. Uh, so what I want to do now is tell you all that there is a Money View subreddit. Um, it is not super active, but I use it. I use it for the Money View reading group and for uh, discussing the MOOC. And every week I also, or not every week, but whenever uh, Dan Nielsen posts a new post to his soon parted substack, I share it there. Occasionally I share other things. Uh, let me show, what, show you what that looks like here. Um, so this is the Money View subreddit, and as you can see, the top two stickied posts are the Money View Reading Group and uh, Money in Banking 2023. So that was our 2023 iteration of the run through of the MOOC. Um, I've got the latest post from Dan Nielsen about the PBOC's uh, balance sheet. Um, I posted my paper here, which I presented yesterday. So this is um, it's an open forum. Uh, anyone who's interested in the Money View um, money viewers or uh, money view curious people can can post here. Um, there are a few posts like that. Uh, maybe, yeah. So this person wants to know about MMT. This is a different person who also wants to know about MMT. So maybe um, during that time, you know, someone brought up money view to the MMT community, and then a couple of them trickled in that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, we have. Uh, if you post there, I will read it. Um, because I read all of them. Um, and I think other money viewers will will read them too. Um, let me see. So this, uh, for example, is the Money View Reading Group um, uh, post. This is the sticky post at the top. Basically says what we are and what we're doing. Uh, political theory of money. You can see our scheduled discussions. These are actually all... Um, the Zoom discussions are all set up through the YSI platform. So these are all links to uh, YSI. So there's also a Money View Reading Group page on, on YSI. So people find it through there. Um, and we've got, um, these are the books we're thinking about reading here. Um, different, you know, if you... If you're interested in reading a book and discussing it with people through a money view perspective, then come to one of our sessions and propose it. Because if you um, want to read a book and you're willing to lead a discussion on it, we like that. Uh, and it's pretty democratic. I lead some of the discussions, but we also have um, other people who've led them. And then here are the recordings of our discussions of all of the past books that we've done. So... That's a lot of links right there. Um, the very first one we did after the first Money View reading group, or after the first Money View symposium, I should say, um, was Dan Nielsen's book uh, on Hyman Minsky. Uh, in the past year, uh, we've done a lot of interesting ones too. Um, we 
finally read and discussed a market theory of money by John Hicks, which is pretty foundational uh, for for uh, Perry and the money view um, in terms of thinking of um, uh, money as market making. Um, and we read uh, Fisher Black and the Revolutionary Idea of Finance, which is Perry's second book. And we had him come in uh, to discuss that with us, which was a lot of fun. I'd never uh, read that book the whole way through, I don't think, before before this year. Um, this is useful for, for me because there are a lot of books that I want to read and there are a lot of things that I want to read um, that I don't on my own. But if it's for the reading group, then that that forces me to do the thing I already want to do. Um, so I find it useful in that way. Uh, and you can use it that way, too, if there's something you want to read. Uh, we've already read a lot of the stuff. So um, maybe we've already covered a, a book. But, you know, we haven't done this yet, but we could go back to to a book we've done before. And we've often after we've we've done a book, we're like, oh, we should do this one again. And that might happen. And if you want to do a book that we did in the past before you were really participating in these, you can do that. Um, the book we did most recently was a 1987 book by Charles Kindleberger that's that's kind of adapted from some lectures where he talks about international capital movements, uh, equilibrium and the balance of payments, long-term, short-term capital flows. Um, that was a really interesting discussion. There's this fellow by the name of Scott Skirm who um, is a practitioner in the repo market and he wrote a book called The Repo Market. Uh, and we read that and we had him on to discuss um, so this is a really fun thing. Um, and we've got a really, um, uh, a good group of people who actually do the readings and, and have, uh, useful insights. Um, so I want to show you, this is the thread for, um, money and banking 2023. There will be another one of these for 2024. Um, and I should say that I think this year, 2024, is going to be the last year that that I kind of lead this. Obviously, anyone can do the MOOC at any time. Uh, it's an open thing. Um, but if you were interested in this particular um, Alex Howlett flavored version of it, uh, I recommend doing it this year. Um, otherwise, you're going to miss it. Uh, but this is what the thread looks like. Um, be a 2024 version, as I mentioned. Uh, we've got, you know, a link to all the lecture videos, uh, and we've got a Y, it's all, also a YSI project, just like uh, the reading group. And then each one of these lectures has its own discussion thread in the subreddit, and we've got recordings of, of the sessions. So the way we did it this past year, and I think it's going to be the same thing this year, is we met every Monday and Wednesday. Uh, and on Mondays, usually we discuss two lectures. And on Wednesdays, we discuss the reading. So I really kind of, we do the readings as part of this, um, uh, but it's not really, um, I mean, I find it really, I find it useful, um, but it's not necessarily the core, the core of the MOOC, but it's a lot of fun. So we just do it every time. Uh, so if you want to read stuff over and over again, uh, just do the readings from the MOOC over and over again. Um, there are some things we add to the MOOC. So when I do the balance sheets, um, I kind of color code them using um, this kind of uh, idea that I got from Borja Clavero. He presented at the first Money View Symposium about kind of the four different ways of discharging a payment obligation. So there's assignment where you're just transferring an asset to someone else. There's issuance where you're issuing a liability to make a payment. Um, so someone else wants to hold your liability as an asset. Uh, then there's set off where it's just going in the opposite direction where you're um, uh, giving someone back the their own liability. Uh, and then there's novation where you pay someone by having them take on a liability. Uh, or sorry, by taking on a liability uh, that they previously had. So you might remember there was a big uh, discussion of novation on on Friday with the, I think that was Friday with uh, Stefan Morau uh, and how uh, the ECB uh, took on all of the target two liabilities of the individual countries. So that's this, that's novation. Um, it's, it's, um, it's not just a word for what the ECB did, but it's a more general term uh, that describes uh, taking on taking on other liabilities. And it happens all the time in the banking system, uh, as we know uh, from the MOOC. Anytime you make a payment from one bank to another, uh, the bank gets both the asset and the liabilities. So the second thing we add uh, is this um, quadruple entry accounting, uh, which we get from, from Dan Nielsen. He calls it that. Uh, and there's essentially, you know, every time you have a transaction, there's a payment going in each direction. Uh, so you can have 
uh, an assignment in one direction and an assignment in the other direction, and we call that an asset swap. Uh, and we have different names for for kind of all the different um, all the different operations. So when a bank makes a payment, uh, when you when you make a payment to a depositor in another bank, the banks have a transfer of portfolio. They transfer the reserves, which is an assignment, and then they transfer the deposits, which is a transfer of liabilities. So the the assets and the liabilities move in the same direction. So that's a transfer of portfolio, is what we call it. Um, I've renamed a couple of these from what, what Dan Nielsen calls them. Uh, I, I call the IOU swap, I call it a mutual obligation. And when it's unwound, I call that a mutual release. Uh, I forget the original terms that he used. He called, he called the mutual obligation a secured loan and he called the mutual release a repayment. Um, but I think um, I like my terms better. I think they're more descriptive of, of what's happening. So that's the those are the big kind of um, tools that we've added or, or or language things that we've we've kind of updated for the MOOC. Uh, and Chris Rimmer is commenting in the chat that he's in his talk today, he's going to be talking about issuance, uh, innovation, assignment, and set off as well in his presentation. Um, so that's that's cool. Um, I like um, that we're using these terms and um, having these concepts kind of memorized in your head, the different payment types and the, the different transaction types. Um, helps you communicate more stuff faster. It's it's like a compression of information, which is useful. Uh, the one big change uh, that I think we wanna do this year is that I wanna incorporate um, Perry Merling's uh, Warsaw lectures from 2017, which are a bit of an update uh, of the MOOC. So we'll kind of be watching a couple of those at the beginning, watching one in the middle and watching a couple at the end. Um, so that's, that's the, that's the change, but mostly it's going to be a similar, similar thing to last year, which, which actually worked out really well. And, um, we had a bunch of people uh, coming to the to the MOOC who, um, when the when the MOOC ended, they joined the reading group. So there's synergy there. So we have we have kind of people with with feet in both. Um, the idea for this originally was a bunch of us wanted to kind of retake the MOOC. We'd already taken it before, but really every year we get new people too. Um, and maybe the new people are more um, invested sometimes because. Uh, it's new to them and exciting, maybe more exciting. It's exciting to us, obviously. Um, uh, so they kind of stick through it to the end. I think um, I think this year, everybody who stuck through it to the end was someone who hadn't hadn't taken the MOOC before. Uh, but now they're they're um, really, uh, most of them, I think, are participating in the reading group now. So it's a funnel for, for new money viewers. Um, the MOOC always has been, and there are always people taking it independent of this. And I think there are a lot of people who don't know about this who just kind of go through uh, Coursera or find out about it in some other way. Uh, so I want to show you um, one of the lecture threads here. This is lecture four, uh, the one that really, oh, actually, let me, first on the main page, there's, I have an example of um, of how to to kind of show the the transactions on the balance sheets, uh, and this example actually comes from Hicks, a market theory of money, where he um, uh, divides the purchase and sale of goods into three steps. First, there's the contract where you agree to pay, and the other person agrees to um, to give you the goods, uh, and that's shown here as a mutual obligation, right? So it's an IOU swap mutual obligation, and then the other two steps can happen in either order, and that's uh, the payment. Um, which we call an asset uh, disintermediation from just from the um, the terms up here. So essentially, um, instead of uh, holding a claim on me, which is indirectly if I'm the buyer and you're you're the seller, instead of holding a claim on me, which is kind of an indirect claim for money, um, you get the money directly and cancel out the claim uh, the claim on me. Um, so that's kind of before the asset, the money was intermediated and now it's been disintermediated is, is a way to think about it. That's why we call that an asset disintermediation. And then there's an asset disintermediation going the other in the other direction for goods. And these two steps can happen in any order. Um, but, you know, Hicks doesn't write this out in a balance sheet. Um, and maybe it takes a little thought. It did take a little thought to really kind of how to, uh, figure out how to record it uh, in a balance sheet. Um, so um, I find this this kind of thing really useful. And I've done this for all the balance sheets in the MOOCs and a bunch. Um, I've created a bunch of new balance sheets from the readings where there weren't, there weren't balance sheets before. Um, 
I've highlighted, uh, I like to highlight the actual settlement instrument, the thing that is money as um, kind of kind of bolded and italicized here. So you can see where the money actually is. All the other things are, are non-money. Sometimes there's gray areas between kind of like, and I find a lot of these going through the MOOC, like really what should we consider money here? What, what shouldn't we? And sometimes the same instrument is money on one uh, uh, set of balance sheets and it's not on another. And obviously if um, something is a liability, money is never a liability. So I might have something called money that's a liability, but it's not a liability on the balance sheet of the issuer. Or maybe you could think of it as money on the, li on the liability side of the issuer, um, but that's not how I notate it. Money is always an asset in this notation. Um, so let's look at lecture four. Um, and this is the lecture that introduces sources and uses. It's actually the only lecture that has sources and uses. It never comes up again uh, for the rest of the MOOC, um, but I, I try to bring it in more um, later on. But you've got, you know, um, I show all the, the sources and uses uh, and the balance sheets, like both versions. So here's uh, Perry buying coffee at Orange Daily Roast, the classic story that we all know from the MOOC. Um, and it's just uh, a, an asset swap, right? Uh, but you can represent the same thing on uh, sources and uses. So the um, the the or, you know, the asset swap is down here. The sources and uses are up here. So um, the expenditure on the on the coffee is is a use, and the source is the disordering of money, right? So that's that's pretty straightforward. But we also have the um, the uh, example of uh, buying dinner at Varelli, where you've got really kind of the four different lines, the goods, the assets, the debts, and the money. Um, I guess uh, Perry likes to call this uh, financial assets and financial liabilities now to, to make it more parallel with, um, with the balance sheet notation. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, this is just kind of a flavor. They're all like this. All of the lectures have... Um, these, these are kind of the, um, the top of each thread looks like this, and then we can have comments below. Sometimes we don't have very much discussion on the Reddit thread and then a lot of discussion in the Zoom, Zoom discussion, which is fine. Um, but you can have a discussion on the Reddit thread. And when people do comment on there, um, I do respond and, there's, it's not really more permanent, but maybe it's more visible because not everyone's going to watch a video, but it's easy to see comments that there are a lot of comments on a thread, that kind of thing. So even if we get, you know, a hundred people signed up this year, um, everyone will have an opportunity to participate in the discussion, uh, even if there's no time in the Zoom, because it's all on Reddit. Do, 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 do. Aha, and Jay says in the chat that he will be uh, taking the last the last run through. Oh, and that reminds me, of course, I shouldn't forget this. If you want to sign up, if you want to know when this is happening, um, you should put your name and email address in this Google Sheet. So maybe Jay, you can be the first one um, after me. Um, and uh, if people don't feel comfortable doing that, you can reach out to me in other ways if you don't want to share your, your, your email address or whatever. But I think everyone's probably fine with that. So I think I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and look at who's here um, from the reading group. I see Larissa. I see Mateus. Um, Maybe that's it so far. I'm not going to call on Larissa because Larissa has COVID and I don't want to make her talk, um, but she's feel to, free, free to, to comment in the chat. Um, so let's see. Do, 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 do. So, so yeah, I guess, um, why don't, uh, Mateus, do you feel like commenting, maybe introduce yourself um, and talk a little bit about what you've been getting out of the uh, online Money View community this year um, and kind of what you what you're hoping to get uh, next year, if you're there. You might just be on the call, but not actually, not actually with us. Well, I can introduce myself. I'm Alex Howlett. Um, I first took the MOOC in 2015. And I've, I did it th maybe three times after that, um, uh, before kind of doing it in the, um, uh, in the Reddit thing. And we actually, I actually, the first time I did this on Reddit, um, was before the first money view symposium. It was that summer of 2020 when we were in the middle of COVID and, um, we were all looking for things to do. Um, and I, um, I did it on Reddit. There was one guy who wanted to help me with 
something I was working on. Uh, and I was like, sure, you can help me, but first you have to do this MOOC. And he, so I, so I kind of did it for him, but then it became like, oh, I'm doing these Reddit posts anyway. Uh, and uh, he ended up dropping out halfway through, but I didn't. Uh, and Perry, Perry was actually looking at them and giving me feedback on each, each of the posts that I did. So that, um, that was useful and it was a good exercise and it was good, it turned out to be good practice for doing it again the next year with YSI and people from the Money View Symposium. Um, Larissa wants to uh, reiterate how great the reading group is. Um, she frequently goes back to uh, her notes from the discussions uh, and will check out and checks out the recordings for the discussion. She, she can't attend. Uh, Larissa is an amazing note taker. She's um, got the Rome uh, note taking app. I don't know if you guys have heard of that, um, but she is very prolific with it. Um, and she shares, you know, whenever we have a discussion, she shares her notes with the group and um, it's super useful to have that. Um, we can, uh, people can comment. Um, I don't really have that much more to say. We've got a lot of time. This session is mainly just to get us warmed up uh, for the day uh, and maybe excited about um, about what's coming afterwards. Um, I don't know, Jay, do you want to say anything about, uh, you've been participating in the Money, Money View Reading Group sometimes. Do you want to say anything about it? Yeah, I mean, uh, for me, it's the same as for you. I mean, for me, it was um, a great disciplining device to do the things I actually want to do. Uh, you know, we have all these piles of books we want to read and how do you get through them? And I really found it very useful to simply assign a book to our, to myself and to the group, right? And just, um, you know, do the best you can to read it. And, uh, and then in the discussions, you always learn something because you never really understand the book um, as good by yourself as you would in a discussion. I think this is the the real the real benefit, and I think um, credit to you, Alex. And we had we've had a really consistent uh, set of people. I mean, running a reading reading for four years is really impressive. Um, and most and especially at the pace we're doing it too. It's like um, it's it's almost unheard of to be reading this this amount of books uh in the group and obviously it's clear that a lot of people um will not be able to sustain that that pace um but i think we we should uh find a way to um, uh re-engage whenever things happen i'm in the same position as as uh as james i'm also in transition moving countries you know transitioning in my life a little bit so but this next year i have more time and uh, i will be back in the reading group for sure and i will be uh really gladly taking the course again and um i think a lot of us are in this position. I'm also excited, like Marina, the new coordinator, she's really a money viewer, I think, uh, already, uh, and she's going to uh, benefit from some engagement in this uh, this way, too. There's um, another reading group she's been starting that is more, there's another uh, reading list that Jan Toporowski has given us to to rattle through, which is the Schumpeter thing. That's the first thing he assigned. So there are synergies between these two efforts here. And... Um, just to say, there have been participants who have voiced, um, you know, dissatisfaction at some some point with the money view or with the types of readings we're doing. Um, and I think those are all valid. I think none, none of us are trying to have a claim to anything here, right? It's just uh, something's interesting to us and we're going to try to use it as best we can. Um, but I think the encouragement is that the group, as Alex said, is super open to suggestions. Would, um, if you don't like something, then propose something else and then read it with us. We'll read it with you. That's the that's the solution. That's actually the YSI way to sort of um, uh, in YSI, a few things will happen uh, if you don't do it yourself or if you don't, don't have intrinsic motivation. It's not a community that's just going to um, spoon feed you but actually what alex is doing is spoon feeding us so i think you're that's the closest you're going to get to having somebody do the work for you that you can appreciate uh outside of a course setting or a formal setting this is the best we can have um and i think this is a real a real benefit and um yeah um i have a huge set of things i want to read uh, i have a huge set, you know uh, those of us who are starting a phd or in the middle of a phd or engaging with projects uh, this is the right time or the right place to sort of engage with, with ideas. Yeah, and just wanted to say the backbone of this has been Alex. There have been a lot of people. I've been impressed with the stability of the group. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. And I think it's just 
we should just view the Money View Symposium as as a way to sort of re-engage with everybody else periodically. You know, we've we've discussed that there's different um, different ways of uh, people have different cycles, different ways uh, uh, how their life is working professionally or academically. And so the Money View Symposium is sort of the, the opportunity every year to re-engage with the group. And if you feel you want to dive deeper into something uh, or a set of topics, this is a, a place to do it. Um, Alex didn't mention this specifically, but there's also off-week discussions. So we're, we're also open to sort of uh, shape specific uh, agendas or, just, or papers that are that are that can be discussed uh, at leisure. Um, yeah, and that really took off during the um, SVB crisis. People, we were right. in the reading group, and we're like, we want to talk about this. So we just had a session on that. Um, for our main readings, we kind of meet every other week, so there's there's gaps in between. And on the off weeks, um, we're often discussing something or reading a paper, um, something uh, kind of uh, smaller than 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 a full than a full book. Um, and I should say that. Um, you know, Jay mentioned that if you want to read something, you know, bring it to us. Uh, and I have to say that if you're willing to put in the work of leading a discussion on something, then we have room for that. There's, you know, anything you want to read, we will, we will do at this point. I mean, we can imagine a future where the group is so popular that everybody, um, you know, we have to say, say no to certain things, but that's not the the world we're living in uh, right now. Um, Larissa is also pointing out that it's valuable to have um, the authors discuss their work in small sessions. And yes, um, we have been very successful in getting authors to join us. I think the only ones who haven't said yes have been the dead ones. Um, so, mm -hmm. so we didn't we didn't get Ralph Hawtrey, for example, but we got um, another guy who's who's like a Ralph Hawtrey scholar. What was his name, Jay? Do you remember? Yeah, he he runs this blog. Um, I'll... Yeah, he yeah, he was Glazer. I, what was that? Glazer. David Glazer, right? Yes, yes, he's the one. David Glasner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. David Glasner. Yeah, yeah. Um. Oh, and he hello, Matthias. Um. Yeah. Hello. If sorry. You, yeah. If you'd like to talk happy, at all happy. about, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, happy to chip in about the about the reading group. Sorry, I'm kind of in the middle of traveling. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's been a great adventure, and I think that one of the biggest uh, things that uh, help you keep going is that the, the knowledge you accumulate through those readings, which are often quite quite heterodox, they are, they are centered around microfinance. Uh, but but we've done so uh, such a vast and array of different uh, uh, perspectives, both uh, you know the history we, we've done. Uh, say pre 19th century central banking to the very recent uh, more technical stuff on mm, on finance on, on on how central banking is done has evolved uh, and we keep referring back to those discussions to these arguments so uh, I also think that we are kind of growing within the group and our arguments and discussions are uh, getting more uh, more sophisticated but at the same time we are very much open to uh, to, to new people to to new perspectives um, and um, the I think the advantage for me uh, is, I mean, one, uh, that being uh, based in, in Europe, uh, uh, the time zone is not, a, is not an issue because of the, the usual time that we, uh, that we meet, uh, but also that uh, you can stay connected with the group even if you are going through um, uh, more, more busy times otherwise, in your, otherwise with, your, with your other commitments. Uh, but then you find out that the group is about to uh, do an interesting reunion, or maybe you uh, suggest one and uh, you're happy to lead one yourself uh, then everyone is very welcoming and and, and scheduling uh, is not uh, is not a problem uh, worst case scenario you have to wait a couple of weeks uh, before uh, your books or a set of articles uh, turn um, comes up uh, so i would really highly recommend uh, anyone to uh, come uh, come read come discuss uh, with us uh, going forward All right, thanks, Mateus. Um, uh, Sheng Shengbei, are you there? Um, Shengbei has also been participating um, in the reading group. Yeah, do you want to introduce yourself and maybe say a little bit of what you've been getting out of the group? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, Alex. Uh, yes, I just joined, and uh, uh, yes, I I was in this group. Uh, in fact, I joined quite a few uh, discussions, and uh, most recent one was um, uh, Michael Pettis, and I think the broad. Uh, Focus really when we focus mostly on uh, 
uh, monetary economics, right? So uh, I think all of us got a very interested in the money view perspective. And also I mentioned uh, on multiple occasions that uh, I was trying to really uh, focus uh, with every, anal analyze it with the focus of between monetary economics and also um, macroeconomics and also finance. Kind of that's where uh, I, I've been uh, doing all my trading, right? Because I've been in Wall Street and doing, uh, uh, spent a few years in China running some uh, uh, trading business over there too. So those uh, elements are the foundation for my framework. And I, I got a lot from uh, this uh, uh, group. And uh, it's a, uh, so I, I wish I could actually do all of them, frankly, but uh, I think I got a lot of them. And uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really a huge encouragement among uh, uh, each other, uh, between all of us, right, to, to help uh, really uh, make, that, uh, make that happen. Uh, thank you all for, for that effort. All right. Um, maybe Perry, do you want to comment on, you've come in a few times uh, to discuss with us, uh, most recently Fisher Black, and then before that, uh, we had two sessions on Money and Empire. Um, so you're talking about the reading group, um, but yeah. you also mentioned that the first time you went through the MOOC, um, I was watching your Reddit and uh, and and chiming in. Um, I haven't uh, done that in later iterations, but I'm taking notes here because one of, you're going to hear later on today. You know, my goal now it was it was the fall of 2012 that that MOOC was filmed, and so. The world has changed since then, um, and I've changed since then, and the money view framework has been developed, and none of that's in the MOOC, you know, but um, so I'm glad to see the things that you're adding. These particular, you know, technical tools aspect, it's not so much, I haven't done much at all in terms of developing technical tools, so I'm glad to hear what they are, because I will then look at them and see if this is something I should adopt myself. Um, I hadn't realized that I teach sources and uses and then I don't use it for anything. Um, that would be irritating as a student to learn something and then not see it. I think I do now when I teach it at BU, I do use it for more. Um, the, there's, a, there's a model that Boreo and Disyatot have about balance of payments um, and uh, that, I, that I actually have a problem set on. So I use it. I do use it more, and and the reason to do sources and uses was is to try to connect with macroeconomics, you know, because macroeconomics is all about flows, and so where we how do you think about that, you know? So that's that's why I'm as a bridge to engaging with macroeconomics, but I can see that um, I don't succeed in doing that in the 2012 version. <laughs> um, the uh, the Borio so, and Disyatot model is that the capital flows in the current account is that that paper. That paper. Okay, well, cool. That's a... the most recent uh, off-week reading we did in the reading group. Okay, so there's a speech, okay, that Borio gave that's very accessible, and I assigned that to the students. They're they're undergraduates, um, but it builds on an actual working paper that he cites in the speech, um, and the working paper has an actual model there, which I adapt um, and teach to the students, um, and uh, that might be something that you're interested in um, that... Uh, I think I have some PowerPoints and, and a problem set about that. Um, the point the point being that a particular a particular um, kind of trade flow, okay. Um, uh, so so it's a little model, uh, and we have time. So can I maybe I can tell you a little bit about it. So it's um, the it's a it, there's sort of two kinds of activity in the model. One is production. That you, uh, which is happens in period one, that the production firms hire labor and use labor to produce a good, okay, which they then sell to another firm, okay, which just stores it till the next period, um, and then in the next period, the 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 firm that has stored that good sells it to the workers who eat it, you know. So it's a it's it's a two it, so there's time in there because there's two periods. Um, and both of these activities have to be financed. That's the point. You know, production needs to be financed, and so does storage have to be financed. Um, and so you get money flows that come from that, and the alchemy of banking. And then they have to be repaid. You know, so 
the the production gets uh, so the question is what if 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 these two activities are in different countries okay and how does that show up in the balance of payments and and how does the financing show up suppose that the financing all happens in one country although the production happens in two countries or the financing all happens in some third country um, so that it's offshore or you know how is that going to show up in the balance of payments how's that going to show up and so it's quite a interesting you know just a little mickey mouse little model that then makes you more suspicious of the balance of payments uh, data that you're getting because you're because it shows gross flows also you know so so some of the gross flows are going to net out in some cases and they're not going to net out in other cases depending on where the banks are and yet the actual real activity is the same you know so yeah. all is so so you can see that the actual real activity um can show up in in quite different ways in financial flows depending on where the banks are and i think it's it's a very illuminating sort of Thing. So I'm, I am, there is a, and in fact, I do both balance sheets and sources and uses, and the sources and uses are also consolidating so that you can do balance of payments so that you can say in this country, we're going to be recording these flows, net flows with the other country, you know, and what are the gross flows and net flows. So, so I, that's one of the things I should make a little note of. I haven't made it. That's a, that's something that I've added in my own teaching. <clears throat> That because I've been making it more international, one of the things that was disappointing about the move for me uh, was that it's because it started from Stigum, you know, it really is US focused, it's very US money market focused, it's not very global. Um, and all of my work in the last decade has been extending the money view in a globalized direction um, and writing the Kindleberger book and so forth. So all of my classes now say global money. So that's one thing to say. Um, maybe I'll just open uh, another branch of possible discussion. Um, you don't mention Alex, um, but but um, Alex, uh, last spring, I taught a class at Boston University that went through the MOOC. Um, uh, every single lecture, just like you're doing on, on Reddit um, and with the students. And Alex came to that. You were there. Yeah. And you gave me little... Uh, notes on each one of them, which I have. So I will be thinking using that as I'm thinking about revising. And I was initially thinking maybe I could use the lecture notes that I have, you know, as the basis for a book. And I came to realize that no, I need to start from scratch, really, you know. So uh, that was a consequence of that of that teaching. We went through the videos and also the lecture notes that were from 2016, which are not exactly the same as the videos, which I didn't realize. Um, and uh, so that was a useful exercise. And then this last fall, um, I was teaching my graduate class, which is a topics class. And we, we also had further interaction. Um, so I, I, uh, what I appreciate is the way that Alex, you know, that because Alex is teaching this on Reddit and so forth, that it, it, it extends the, the, the reach. <laughs> It's something I don't have to do it, okay? And so that means I can do other things, and I can develop, I can write other papers and things like that, and which I, which I'm, which I'm doing. So I, I also want to add my uh, thanks to Alex for that, for that work. Um, I would not treat money always as an asset. I don't. It's a liability of the central bank. Um, but the uh, and and if you said that on my exam, you would get it wrong. Um, so uh, I, because I wanted, I wanted to be, to just say different layers of credit, that money is the highest form of credit. So this is the point. You, you were mentioning yesterday that you're reading H.D. McLeod, you know, so mm -hmm. yes, money is the highest form of credit. Um, and uh, I read H.D. McLeod myself. I didn't mention that yesterday, you know, but when I was in graduate school and I was looking for um, direction, um, I also started from Schumpeter in a way. I didn't have anyone to tell me to start from Schumpeter. I just found it eventually. And I read those chapters and I saw that Schumpeter is pretty enthusiastic about McLeod. So, okay, let me, I'm at Harvard. That means I have Widener Library. So let me just go and get H.D. McLeod and I can read H.D. McLeod. And uh, that was before the internet or anything. You had to have access to a world-class library in order to get these things. But I did. So I was able to read anything I wanted because it's all in Widener. 
um, and no one else ever checked it out. So um, it was all basically a private library. And uh, that was how I, so it's very interesting to me to watch, to, to, as you were speaking about this group, this process of self-education um, that you're involved in. And so I just want to tell you another anecdote, which was, it's related to the idea I had way back when for starting YSI in the first place, okay? That when I was in graduate school, um, it was a very alienating experience for me, these, these classes you go to and, and, and the other students who many of them were not really all that intellectually interested. They're, they're, they were more uh, interested in sucking up to the professors and getting jobs and advancing in, 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 in up the hierarchy of academia or something. And so to sort of keep myself sane, I started a reading group, the political economy group, which met in my living room every Monday night. Um, and uh, different people would take charge of each night and they would present on anything they wanted to do, something they were reading. Um, we, I don't think we read ahead of time, but we were, so it was a, a lot of, you know, cell, support group kind of. And uh, the, and I think that's why I was able to survive graduate school and didn't drop out. It was, it was uh, an important. And so when INIC Creative started, I realized, you know, there's a lot of students like me who don't have who don't have a community, you know, and we could create a community of support for them, um, like the PEG, like that was important to me. And then I added to that the idea that there's actually a lot since I by then I was a professor, there are a lot of professors who who don't have the students that they should have. And so why don't we try to figure out a way to link these things up? professors who don't have students and students who don't have professors. And, and that was the, one of the original founding motives, you know, of, of the Young Scholars Initiative, as Jay, as Jay will remember. It was, it was Jay who sort of made it concrete, you know, in those early years of experimenting, develop an event, which eventually it came to this webinar idea, you know, came to other pieces of it. But um, so it's very gratifying for me, YSI is now 10 years old, you know, or more, to see, you know, well, look, it sort of is happening. As you say, it's lived for four years. That means that means it's doing something. It's it's people are getting something out of it. Um, and so that 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 makes me happy. Yeah. Um I now that you you bring that up, I suppose I, I did the MOOC twice uh in the last year since I did it in person with you at BU and then also um through the through the reddit group and ysi online um i think uh yeah the 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 insight that um where the banks are can completely change the uh balance of payments and how you measure it um uh that that's useful it it yeah it makes you realize that what is the balance of payments really telling us um and where the banks are can be completely arbitrary it can be like okay a uh, uh uh, multinational, you know, bank or financial institution decided to change where they, you know, do their accounting or something like that. And, and is that, is that really changing how the countries relate to each other? Maybe for tax purposes or something, I don't know. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, I like that. Um, in terms of, uh, money always being an, an asset, um, I'm not, I, I mean, I think you know this, but I'm not saying that um, money isn't a liability of the of the central bank. I'm saying that when it's on the balance sheet of the central bank as a liability, uh, I'm not thinking of it as money. Or when when uh, deposits are on the, the liability side of a bank, I'm not thinking of it as money. But the same instrument is money as an asset on the balance sheet of somewhere, somewhere else. Maybe I still would have failed yeah, that okay. question on your that, exam. That's helpful. That's Maybe not, you know, but... So one of the problems with sources and uses, and it's also the problem with the balance sheets, okay, is that the hierarchy of money is hard to display there. You know, that sources and uses is sort of horizontal and is so that, you know, one person's one person's financial asset is another person's hoarding, you know, and yep. so that's a problem. And uh, that I became aware of that when students got confused in doing problem sets. And I realized, oh, that problem is because they they are taking seriously this hierarchy thing, and which they should, 
And so now I have to, the actual rules of sources and uses accounting are not gonna work here. You know, if we want to also be, we have to alter it in some way. Yeah. For, yeah. for that. I just, I did something in the yeah. MOOC this year um, when we were doing yeah. sources and uses where um, I showed how, uh, uh, yeah, one, uh, uh, you know, a bank's uh, uh, financial liability um, could be money to someone else. So you, so you have uh, a borrowing on one side and the counterparty is hoarding. Um, and I showed that that, that means hierarchy. That's, that's what hierarchy looks like in the sources and uses when the, when the things don't line up. Um, and I think, you know, you can use, you can use sources and uses to kind of highlight the hierarchy in that way. Um, but it, it kind of, it does break the rules a little bit. But the breaking of the rules highlights well, the hierarchy, I suppose. I'm, I, now I'm remembering the reason I put sources and uses in there. It was I used to teach uh, before I taught money and banking. I taught intermediate mac macro, okay, mm -hmm. and um, I I found you know NEPA accounting very confining, and so I I always taught the students sources and uses accounting um, as well, okay, at the very beginning of the class, okay so that they would see flow funds and see flow funds as the natural accounting structure for macroeconomics. Um, and I guess I probably just carried that over into the banking class without thinking about it. Um, and uh, I, sh I should have I should have thought more about it. Um, and maybe I used the balance sheets more in the money and banking class than I did in macro, whatever. Um, are you are you responding to Karen's? Yeah. So Karen says the first chapter of yeah. Europe and the dollar um, shows a uh, balance of payments measurements in uh, in balance sheet form. Yeah, uh, that's true. That that yeah. um, let me also say that Kindleberger wrote an update of that. Okay, which is which is was published in the Journal of Political Economy um, and is and is in his final collected uh, volume. Um, I can, if you're interested, I'll, I'll just get it from my library and show it to you. Okay. And I would say, I mean, I think, I, I think that's a very important piece, whatever updated gets, <clears throat> because it really shows that, that there's no, there's no one rule in that game. There are different ways, and especially what is difficult in the U.S. barrels of payments is the capital flows, short-term capital flows. Is that money, or is it yeah. is it is it uh, short-term flows? And 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 that that means it shows in different places in the balance sheet. So it's not at all uh, so that the the ensemble of balance sheets in the world do not add add up to zero. That's the point you can get out of that. So I think it's a necessary piece to study whatever the latest version is. The balance sheets of the world do not add up to zero. That's an interesting thing to say. Yeah, the assets and liabilities do not, because, because simply there's asymmetry in it. And, and that has to do with the way you, you, uh, you uh, register the, uh, you enter the, the short-term flows. And especially your dollar market upset the whole picture. I guess if you if you add all the accounts together, it still adds up to zero. But um, what goes on what account might might be different, um, might be asymmetric, is what you're saying. Is that right? Yeah. Like what's on the money account for one country might be on the capital account for another country, that kind of thing. No, it's sort of how it's sort of how what, what is a balancing item? Is a short term inflow for the to the US is that under or below the line of the balance? That's what right. it is about. Yes. So and, it's about uh, categorization. And since, yeah. And since since the euro dollar market upset the whole thing because the euro dollar disappeared from the money supply, right? Uh, yeah. and then all of a sudden it enters again. So 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 it enters without any counterparty. So therefore, it is uh, it doesn't add up to zero. Well, that's so that's an artifact of the way the official accounts are done. Um, you may remember that last year at the Money View Symposium, we had a little chat with Claudio Borgio, who is you know the BIS is very concerned that the way that po policy debate is all in NEPA kind of framework and is controlled therefore by the IMF. Which controls and 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 that that's a problem because it hides a lot of important things and it distorts understanding 
And so they are interested in making some headway in developing an alternative set of, of international accounts. Um, so this is the this is Kindleberger's collected uh, works here, and he he includes here. It's a sort of update of that chapter that you mentioned there, there, Alex. Um, it's published in the Journal of Political Economy, um, nineteen sixty nine, um, and uh, I I talk about it too in the Kindleberger book. Um, at that time, um, Bob Mundell was the editor of the Journal of Political Economy. And so that's how it came to be published there. So the, he's taking advantage of the fact that he has a student in a high editorial position to take, whereas the, ori the original publication in 65, okay, was, uh, where was that published? Um, the, uh, yeah, it was published in Essays in International Finance, the Princeton series. So it's not in a journal that's accessible to everybody. You know, it's a, it's a specialty place. So, but you can compare those 65 to 69, right after 65, that's when he writes the, the, the economist piece. You know, he's concerned that, that uh, there's this the political debate about, um, oh, the big US balance of payments deficit and oh my God, this is a terrible thing. And he's saying that's just because people don't understand what that number means or that it comes, it's an artifact of the accounting structure. Um, and that, that, though, that's the motivation for both the 65 and the 69 uh, pieces. And in some sense, 69 is a follow-up. It's responding to criticism of the 65 piece and also criticism of the Economist article too. So it's worth, if, if you're reading 65, you should read 69 um, as, as, as well. Um, is the 69 one is equilibrium in the balance of payments? Yes, correct. Yeah. It's called equilibrium in the balance of payments. Uh, go ahead, Marina. Um, I have a question. I think as a as an outlier, out uh, <laughs> liar person uh, from the money view, uh, but I'm wondering um, because balance sheets are calculated with different methods, and uh, obviously, uh, for example, in the financial industry, they have different methods to record liabilities, assets, etc. So my question is because I'm thinking about <laughs> this poor credit economy, uh, how you can see uh, if an economy is actually in debt with this framework that you have, how can you um, realize this? Because if, if everything is uh, adding zero, if all the balance sheets are uh, adding zero, how come we can say that uh, this economy is in, in, in debt? You, I don't know if I'm very out of the framework that you work on, but I think this is for me very important. It's, and it's kind of related with uh, what you were talking about that globally, if you add all the balance sheets, it's not going to be zero. Uh, that's a current qu uh, comment, so. Yeah, well, that's an artifact of the way accounting is done, but conceptually, the world is a closed economy. <laughs> the world is a closed economy. And so everyone- yeah, we are not trading with- uh, Everyone's dead is somebody else's <laughs> asset. So that if you aggregate it all up, it should all wash out, you know? And that, I think that's the basic point. And you can- and, Yeah. I mean, the balance sheets, um, even if they balance to zero, you can still, and they're always gonna balance to zero. Um, you can still look at the size of the balance sheets, right? Um, if the balance sheets get really, really big, that means there's a lot more, more debt in the economy. Um, and I suppose you could have, um, you know, when I, when I borrow from a bank, um, and, and spend money, um, I suppose you could say my net worth is going negative, or you could put an asset, um, on the side of my balance sheet that represents how I'm expecting to, you know, get cash flows to pay back my loan or something like that. Um, uh, it's a, it's a conceptual thing, right? We're not doing actual um, accounting rules, balance sheets. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, you can, and, and, and just looking at the balance sheet and the size of them isn't going to tell you the answer either because different instruments are different things. Um, you know, what is your, is your funding? Is it a long-term loan? Is it kind of overnight money market funding that kind of thing? Um, and, and there's this, you know, when, when you're talking about who's in debt and who's not, um, that feels a little bit more like, um, a question of solvency, like is our people's net worth negative, that kind of thing. Um, and the money view is really focused on 
liquidity. So are you going to be able to meet the cash commitments that are coming due today? And what's your time pattern of cash flows coming in look like from your assets? Uh, so the assets represent um, future cash flows coming in and the liabilities represent um, you know, future cash commitments of cash flows going out. Um, and then you can also think about them as, as residues of past, past things as well. Um, but it doesn't, I, I don't think this framework hides hides debt. I think if you aggregate too much and net too much, then um, then you lose information. Um, yeah, does that make sense? I, I, let me just say that, that that's all, I, I, I endorse all of that, that Alex just said, um, that that's right, that what we use, we use these accounts as ways of thinking, okay? And they don't necessarily line up with the kind of approved accounting methods. You know, the approved accounting methods for corporations, for example, are designed to give stockholders information about the corporation, you know? And so they they are including some things in there. So they have rules based on what they're gonna be used for, okay? And similarly, national income accounts, you know, there was something they wanted to use them for. And so they developed a set of accounts. And what we're kind of doing in the many view, there's something we want to use them for. And so we are trying to develop accounts that help us think in the way we want to think. That is to say, of an economy of a, the of the economy as a set of interlocking balance sheets um, with time dated promises to pay, and the times matter, you know, and the and the settlement constraint matters. And so you need you need to have some way of of highlighting that. I use the sources and uses for that, by the way, Alex, you know, pointing out that below the line there, the three ways you can meet a payment conceptually are by dishoarding, you know, paying in reserve, or by uh, rolling it over to the future, which is funding liquidity, or by selling something, selling a financial asset of some kind, which is market liquidity. So those three forms of liquidity are the three rows on sources and uses. And uh, that that's, uh, which I, I don't think that the people who created the, the flow of funds accounts really had that in mind, but you can use it as an instantiation of the settlement constraint. You know that where 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 it where it shows up in thinking about, and of course we're thinking about sources and uses typically for individual cash flow entities, whereas the sources and uses accounts are sectors. You know, there's a financial sector, there's a business sector. They were trying to figure out how how does savings flow from savers to investors, and you know what how what is the financial how does intermediation happen? That's what that's really what Copeland was concerned about, and that's not what we're using them for so much at all. Yeah, you're you're the only person I've seen who uses the three lines to really represent the three different kinds of uh, liquidity. I think even when Dan Nielsen does it, he's not um, he doesn't follow that. Well, he's he was teaching a macro class, yeah. so maybe maybe that's why I should ask him for his notes too because. That will, I'm trying to collect these kind, you know, these sort of people who've used the money view for something. I want to there. I want to think about well, how can I, you know, point to those a little bit in the book. You, you'll see in my talk later on. I want to say, well, here's what people have done with it in various fields. Um, in political science, you could see, you know, the, the that paper by Stefan, you know, in in crypto and whatever that people yeah. have taken some of these these concepts in directions that I never particularly imagined they would and so I'm uh, it, it's interesting and building out the accounting which I I didn't really spend that much energy on it you know I uh, I came up with the accounting because it seemed to me originally I did balance sheet stuff sort of after the midterm and and then I realized you know I keep I should move this earlier in the class you know this is going to help so it wound up in lecture four by the time the MOOC was created, but it used to be really like lecture 15 or something. It was it was later. Um, and so you probably can't imagine how was I possibly talking about things without balance sheets, but I was because Stigum does. Stigum talks about the flow of funds accounts. She, the flow, I'm sorry, she talks about the Fed funds, the Fed funds market. She talks about the Eurodon market without balance sheets really. And so you're, they're, they're instruments and how they're traded so forth and so that's how the course began was using that as the textbook and gradually i developed analytical tools 
that seemed like they were natural for under for 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 drawing links across these markets and seeing well why do these markets exist in the first place? She's kind of weak on that, you know. And what 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 are they doing? What are they actually doing? And uh, so that's that that I added. Yeah, um, I like I like that, and I like using balance sheets from the, for the beginning. It's hard. It is hard for me to imagine, and I think. I hope that one day it'll be hard for people to imagine not having the trainer model from the beginning too. Um, I think uh, for sources and uses- You're absolutely right. There was no trainer model until I started doing Fisher Black and discovered trainer. So I started just with Stigum. So, and, and I didn't even have the settlement constraint. You know, The idea that it's payments a system, this actually came from Alan Young, that he said, well, we can understand the whole monitor system as really just a settlement system, I thought. Jeez, I never learned that in graduate school. You know that you you could do that. Let's let's do that. Let's see where that goes. Let's see where that goes. And uh, mm -hmm. so uh, yeah, I was going to comment on sources and uses. That once you have a lot of transactions, like once it gets complicated enough, it's really hard to maintain that. You know, three lines for the three different types of liquidity uh, conventions. So I think maybe that's that's part of the reason why. Uh, Dan Nielsen doesn't stay uh, consistent with that because he's talking about more complicated stuff. Um, uh, we've got a bunch of comments in the chat. Um, and Shungbei has his hand up. Uh, why don't we go to Shungbei first? Go ahead, Shungbei. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I actually do have a question. When you look at the balance sheet, we look at asset and liability. But one thing I wondered, actually, I'm not sure if there is an answer already. I wonder a lot is about uh, the equity, right? Because if you look at balance sheet, the typical balance sheet, if you look at corporation, people talk about, let's say, book value, which is equity. And uh, whether it's a PB valuation, I mean, of course, not uh, PB is not uh, applicable to all kinds of uh, corporations valuation, but at least book value is an important part of that. And the earning and income corporation has, of course, theoretically goes to a book value, of course, whatever you can raise through a, a sort of convertible bond or through a stock offering goes to book value too. So uh, the reason I brought this up is uh, uh, normally, let's say what I was uh, first starting to look at the uh, uh, monetary economics, and of course I'm heavily influenced by uh, Perry's uh, book. And uh, I that's kind of uh, the, the, the place I, I want to, uh, I, I used to analyze a lot of things. In the later years, I, of course, there's always a little bit disconnect. Uh, no, I'm not disconnect. There's always, a, there's element when you look at equity valuation uh, or any household look at their, their, their balance sheet, they tend to focus more on the, whatever they have saved. It really, it's kind of similar to, to equity uh, for that. And also another element I want to point out is if you look at the, let's say uh, last few years, as, as I mentioned, I was in China, I spent far more time thinking about the huge contrast about China and the US. And uh, many people here knew that I started to tell people the turning point in China occurred in 2021, which, uh, which means that in my view, I actually did a, a bunch of analysis and believe that uh, China was probably going to an irreversible decline for probably 20, 30 years long, a massive scale. I think many people heard my view and I use a, a, a basically I talk, I talk about why China's uh, reliance on, on this uh, public ownership structure. Uh, uh, a lot of that through land sale and I use the classic levy profit equation to talk about the unique angle of China. But, but really, if you look at that element, right, there is this equity portion. Uh, in this case, I say China's uh, model uh, is so different from all other people and the uh, funding approach is so different from all, all other people. And uh, uh, that's why it's, it grows so much faster than every country. And uh, and then of course, at that time, China thought they were doing great. And the US is probably on a decline. I was pointing out is the exact opposite in 2021. So it's from this point on that divergence will occur. But it will be fascinating in my view, if I, uh, if I can, because uh, I have spent a lot of time thinking about that, how to uh, use equity element as part of this uh, money view uh, framework and how to uh, maybe just purely from money view perspective really can explain uh, why US, uh, of course, that's my belief, US is on, on a huge rebound. I know despite crack of financial capitalism, 
uh, ca financial capitalism has huge cracks at this point. But how do we point out the problem and potential growth and how China, if you use money meal perspective, talk about explain the past growth and also the, the, the weather decline uh, is almost irreversible. And uh, so basically that's kind of a question I, I try to brought up is equity uh, component in the, um, whether that uh, is a fully explained in money meal perspective. Yeah, um, I think that's an interesting question. Uh, so in the MOOC, of course, we don't really talk about equity very much. Um, I suppose you can think of equity as um, kind of just a liability that, um, I mean, obviously it, it is kind of like a liability that just, it it, it gives the owners whatever's left over um, from, yeah, so you know, when you liquidate. A, it's not a payment commitment necessarily. Yeah. Although in in fact, some you know there are companies that have regular dividend policy, and and uh, so it it that moves in a bond like direction, you know. If you and 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 the market will be freaked out if you skip a dividend or something. But in terms of the binding settlement constraints, the fact that dividends are not you know actual you know they're not actual promises to pay. They're that it means that you that that is a soft budget constraint. You know, you don't you don't ha you don't have to come up with the dividend. Um, and uh, but we we don't talk about equity at all, and that's why because it's not actually a promise a promise to pay. Um, now, but maybe maybe you know maybe we should open our minds about that. I mean, the fact that we have all of these private equity people coming, you know, they they want to turn this firm okay, into a cash machine, right? And that's what private equity does. And then they loot it and they leave it by the wayside. So it's, uh, you know, to understand private equity, it, it would require you say, you know, you can, you, you, by accumulating all the equity, you can then bring all those cash flows forward, you know, that were embedded in the assets of the firm um, by, by plundering it. You know, and uh, they pay it out to themselves. That's basically what they do. Um, and uh, that ch that's 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 a different. It, 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 so it's it's true that I don't talk about equity in the MOOC. I don't talk about options in the MOOC. You know, which seems to me something that I should I sh I should be doing. I just do swaps because swaps are a natural bank, a natural bank. You know, it's a swap of IOU, so it's a natural instrument to talk about. Um, but, uh, there, there's a, a number of other things that I don't, ha don't talk about, but equity, equity is one of them. You're quite right. My, my question, I just want to clarify a little bit on my question, right? Because equity, I'm not talking about equity market, so like equity valuation perspective. I'm purely talking about why you have a balance sheet. The, 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 if for each type of corporation is always a, a implicit constrained in terms of the leverage ratio, right? Whether it applies to banks or for, for a typical corporation, anybody with a heavy asset uh, or light asset, right? There are, there's all kinds of uh, uh, implicit norms for, for the uh, equity portion because balance equity within the accounting identity is on the liability side. It's not a residual. I mean, you can think it's residual of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the debt, right? Because the, the debt plus equity must equal must be equal to the uh, the asset the total asset base, right? But the growth of equity is a fundamental driver for the entire balance sheet growth. So how that element, uh, because that's that's true. It's almost all everything. Even uh, so, uh, how that element uh, can be used for for uh, this analytical framework is one uh, question that I have in mind. The other one, of course, I mentioned, there's a huge difference between Chinese government versus all other government. Chinese government owns equity of the country for a big chunk of that. So because of that, that could very well be a huge difference in the China's uh, uh, public ownership. Uh, public is not really public of the general public, it's really the government in, in that sense. That form of uh, system is fundamentally different from the typical System we're used to, so that is that triggers growth models. So I'm just, that's that triggered my question: How to look at the overall view, right? Because that could be a way to explain, uh, to pr explain predict 
a huge economic development. Anyway, so I, I asked a lot of questions just now. <laughs> Let me close this. All right. Um, yeah, I like that um, the money view allows allows for um, more questions than than we can possibly answer in a in a morning session. Um, uh, I hope everybody's asking questions. Um, I think uh, maybe Matthew wanted to comment on um, some concerns he has about balance sheets. Do you want to do you want to speak now, Matthew? Or James? Yeah, Matthew's fine. I just can't change my name on here because it's a Russian keyboard. Uh, anyways, um, yeah, so something that I, I've noticed, it was brought up before that when we're dealing with actual accounting sheets, you know, accounting practices are different from country to country. This raises issues if you use the actual balance sheets. But this has been brought up within the money view, but something that hasn't been brought up is issues with using notional balance sheets in particular. So Borja has shown us that, you know, money creation and payment payments are very flexible. You know, there's many ways you can make a payment um, and things like that. But when we're dealing with notional balance sheets, it's very easy to just like fabricate stuff that may or may not be there. And I've been guilty of this in my own work. I haven't shown it yet, but um, it's something that I've been like skeptical of. Like, is is this really here? Is it not? I've also seen it in like Dan Nielsen's work. I think it was something uh, on China. He was, he was writing on China. Uh, let me just pull it up here. But um, he basically kind of fabricated uh, collateral in his balance sheets where it could just be like trust, right? Maybe there's no collateral there whatsoever. Maybe maybe there it's just a loan based on trust. And I've seen him do this in balance sheets. And um, when we're dealing with notional balance sheets, it's kind of hard. You may just be making stuff up. We have to be very careful with it. Um, and that's just something that isn't brought up. Just be careful with these things. Really think it through. Because sometimes you think, hey, I just need to make sure everything balances out. As long as it balances out, I'm good. That's not that's not the only thing you need to make sure of. Are you not a fan of when um, Perry is kind of adding the same thing to both sides of the balance sheet to show kind of the uh, risk exposures, like that exercise? Is that part of what you're getting uh, at? Um, it's not that I'm not a fan of it. I'm just saying you need to be careful. You need to like double check it, right? Absolutely, right? Um, you can add stuff there, but make sure that it's actually that, right? So for example, in the in the example that I had before, where you may be adding collateral to a balance sheet for a loan, that collateral may not be there, right? It may just be a loan entirely based on trust, a ninja loan, <laughs> right? Uh, sometimes it's not there and you that just need to kind of be careful be there. with it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, I get, it may I... be a loan without collateral, right? Sure. But you're, you're fat, you're, uh, you're conceptualizing that there's collateral there in your conceptual balance sheet. Right? I guess I'm not sure what you mean. Is that, um, when, um, when, uh, are you talking about like when Dan Nielsen calls uh, a swap of IOUs to collateralized loan? Is that what you mean? Uh, it's it's been a while since I actually looked at it. I'll, I would have to dig, unfortunately, but it is something that's been on my mind. Um, okay. It's just when you're when you're dealing with these notional balance sheets, your your the first thing on your mind is like, okay, the the actual balance sheets are incomplete. We need to fill them out and make sure that they're balanced. What what could be the balancing factor here, right? Um, oh, kind of inferring what the missing balance sheet yeah. st In, stuff inferring is. Inferring what well, the missing thing is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I and one of the one of the challenges always is that there are often multiple ways to legitimately represent a particular transaction. And so the question is what yes, what point what are you at. what point are you trying to make? <laughs> and um, in order to, I mean, I, I notice, for example, that 
when I put re in the MOOC, when I put repo on the balance sheet, I, I, you know, because it's a swap, it's sort of a, it's sort of a swap. You could put it on either side of the either either side of the balance sheet, and so I say, well, let's follow the money. And so the person who is lending the money has repo as an asset. The person who's who's getting the money has repo as a liability. They have to pay back the money the next day. And so that's my accounting convention. Okay, but it's a convention, and it could be otherwise. Um, and and the the fact that that it, that the language in Britain and the language in Wall Street are different about repo comes from that fact that that you could be following the collateral instead, okay? And then you, which, which and so in fact when Dan does repo, I've seen it on his Substack. He does both. He he puts in both the money loan and the and the collateral so that you see that there's a treasury bill due as well as money due, so that you can see both sides of it which I never did, which I is sort of in the background. You know, it's, it's when you see repo, you know that there's collateral moving the other side, but I didn't actually put it on the balance sheet, which, you know, I can see, you know, you might want to do that, you know, and there, uh, and, and, and that's, tr that's true for swaps too, that I put the swap on, but typically there's a forward, there's an agreement to unwind that swap in the future. So there's a, it's, it's a cash transaction today and a forward transaction at the same time, you could do both of them. So there is there is some judgment, you know, depending on what point you're trying to make, um, and what what you put what you put on there and what you don't. And I think we're 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 working our way toward. We don't have a set of universally accepted conventions. Um, and uh, you know, when I when I when I do, you know. FX swaps or something like that. You know, well, is that an asset or is that a liability? When I show the swap, then you know that one side owes dollars, one side owes owes foreign exchange. But if you consolidate that and say it's a it's it's a, it's a net thing, it's an FX swap, is it an asset or liability? Well, it depends on whether it, at time of inception it's a, it's a zero value it's a zero value uh, instrument. So you could treat it either way, and whether it goes up in value or goes down in value. Um, that's why in corporation, corporate balance sheets, they often put this off balance sheet because they don't know which side of the balance sheet to put it on. Um, and uh, it's, uh, you know, th this is actually the, the, the fact that we're inventing things, okay, is because we're trying to figure them out. You know, it's not a, uh, it's yes, not obvious. Of, of course. It's not obvious what, what, what the right way is. And no, yeah. Yeah. Oh, what I'm just saying is that okay. It, I hate to obvious. um, I hate to interrupt, but I think we're reaching the end of our session, and oh, I want to yeah. give everybody a legitimate uh, ten minute break because that's what we're supposed to have. Um, yeah, I'm going to share in the chat the link to sign up if you want to do the MOOC this summer uh, again, and remind everyone that um, you can sign up for the reading group uh, through YSI. I should post a link to that to 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 to. to um yeah here it is okay. yeah i just wanted to say one thing but but this 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 question perry is exactly what is very crucial in the real world it's not just a question of what we sort of choose uh but it's it is that which causes problems it is that which comes out in crisis it is that which is a, whatever destabilizes the system and which is his own danger. Okay. Well, it's that so, also which makes room for accounting fraud. <laughs> so uh, there, yeah, so it's, it is a challenge. It's a, you're pointing to a legitimate challenge. It's not a, it's not just a technical problem. Yeah. Great. So it sounds like we're all inspired to think about this more. I'm going to stop the recording now.